Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Neil. Um, I'm actually going to talk about something that she just mentioned. Um, so this is maybe like an orthogonal or a complementary approach to poverty mapping. And I work with Stefano at Stanford, and uh, this is a collaboration with a couple professors in the Department of Earth System Science. So we've kind of already motivated this problem, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, basically, poverty alleviation is the number one UN Sustainable Development Goal. And uh, the only thing I really want to emphasize is that the global poverty line is now at $1.90 per day. Um, I'm a grad student, and I know a lot of you guys are or have been grad students, so you know I'm not wealthy. But I often spend more than $1.90 on something as trivial as like donuts or something. So it's, it's not very much money. Um, so some of the reasons why we need to collect data. Um, we can't really solve the poverty problem if we don't know where the poor people are. And the traditional methods of collecting this kind of data is to conduct household surveys. These are very expensive. Um, they don't cover a large percentage of the households in each country. And you don't get very good spatial or temporal resolution. So we propose to use satellite imagery to help us fill in these data gaps. Um, as you can see from these satellite images, uh, they contain useful information. Uh, traditionally, maybe you would have like look at things like shipping records or inventory estimates, or uh, maybe aggregate cultural yield. And that would these images contain some information about those things, but it's unstructured data. So the big question is, what if we can infer the socioeconomic indicators that we care about from these unstructured satellite images? All right. Uh, so the big reason we want to do this is because we don't have very much data, but that prevents us from taking a standard supervised learning approach. Um, so in this approach, we would have satellite images as input, and then we would have the outcomes that we care about as uh, ground truth labels. But we don't have enough of those, so we can't train a very complex model. Um, another problem is that this task is non-trivial for humans, so it's very hard to go on like Amazon Mechanical Turk and have people label these images with whether or not people living there are poor. The way that we're going to get around this data shortage problem is by using transfer learning. Um, so the basic idea here is to um, learn from an easier task, maybe one that you have more training data for, and then apply the knowledge that you've learned to the task that you actually care about. So I don't know if people have seen this movie, but I like to use this as an example. So this is a Jamaican bobsled team. There's no snow in, or ice in Jamaica, so they can't actually practice. So they train on this hill, and then they apply what they learned to compete in the Olympics on ice. So it's a cute example. Um, so the gap that we're actually going to close is uh, this one where we don't have enough poverty measures to train the model directly. So instead, we're going to choose a proxy task where we do have lots of data, and then we can train a deep learning model to go from the input satellite images to some outcome. And then once we've trained that model, we can use what we've learned uh, to predict the poverty measures that we care about. The proxy task that we pick is uh, nighttime light intensity. This data is available everywhere, and it's been shown to be a good proxy for economic development. So this thing right here that looks like an island, it's actually uh, South Korea. And then this dark spot is North Korea. All right, so this is a proxy task. Um, our training pairs are going to be the satellite images and then their nighttime light intensity label. And we have this data everywhere, so we can train a very complex model. Um, we train a CNN uh, to do this uh, three-class classification task. And then we take the features that our CNN learns to extract from the images, and then we use those features to try to predict poverty. And uh, the intuition here is that some of the features that are useful for predicting nighttime light intensity are also good for predicting poverty. Um, but the big question is, uh, do we actually learn to identify useful features? So deep learning models aren't always very interpretable, but we can visualize some of the filters that we learn. Um, so you can see here, are each of these columns uh, corresponds to one filter, and they roughly correspond to uh, filters that identify urban, non-urban areas, uh, water, and roads in satellite imagery. So you can imagine that these, if you were to hand design uh, features, these might be some of the things that you would look for. Okay, so we take those features that we learn, and then we apply them to this poverty prediction task. Uh, so we're actually doing regression on this asset-based uh, wealth index that comes from the DHS surveys. And we find that we outperform some recent uh, methods that are based on call record data um, that were published in Science last year. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to talk about some recent uh, unpublished work. 
So before we were making poverty predictions independently at every location, but as you can see from this map, obviously like wealth isn't distributed randomly. There's some spatial structure. So how can we use that to build better models? Um, what we propose to do is to put a Gaussian process on top of our CNN. So basically, uh, a Gaussian process uh, can model these spatial correlations. So if you have like your prior distribution where with mean zero, and then you make these three observations, um, your posterior distribution will be kind of like drawn towards these observations. Um, and the model that we actually have is there's this linear term that corresponds to the image features, and then a Gaussian process that models the spatial correlations. Um, and that takes care of the residuals with respect to the linear model. Uh, oh yeah, so, so just by adding that on top, we get some very small uh, performance improvements. Um, we think they're kind of small because we don't have very much training data, so uh, it can't really do that much better. Um, so the next step would be to uh, kind of move into the semi-supervised learning regime where we try to use unlabeled data, which we have a ton of, to help us learn a better model. Um, so the idea here is that we want to be able to feed into our model um, all of these unlabeled satellite images that's, that we have so that we learn to uh, learn features that are useful not just for predicting on the training set, but also for un unseen uh, test examples. And the idea is that instead of just training the Gaussian process to maximize the marginal likelihood, we're uh, going to minimize the posterior variance on un unlabeled data as well. Um, so yeah, the intuition is that you want to find features that are good on your training set and your test set instead of overfitting to your training set. And this is, these are some preliminary results, results that we have. Um, you can see that uh, we do get better results. These are mean squared errors. Um, but we think that there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, this is, these are just like preliminary results and we haven't really tweaked the hyperparameters too much yet. So we're hoping to do better than this. Um, yeah, so I, we think that this is kind of a complementary approach to existing methods for predicting distribution of poverty. And uh, hopefully it'll be useful for helping the people who are actually out there solving this, trying to solve this problem. So thank you. Where maybe you try to identify urban structures like factories and roads, <coughs> and then use the presence or absence of those as poverty indicators? Yeah, we've thought about that. Um, I think, so basically, right now we're like learning features automatically, right? So, in that case, you would be talking about like hand designing things that would uh, look for. Or using just, you know, identifying subclasses. Oh. And then using those subclasses to say, you know, this is a poverty area because there's nothing in roads or factories like that. Yeah, we thought about doing that. I think um, the reason we decided to do this is because I guess it was easier because, like, as you can see from the filter uh, filters that we did learn, it does pick up things like um, buildings and roads. And uh, we also right now are only using one resolution of imagery, so you can't actually see like individual buildings at this point. Yeah, but we're we're working on uh, some like multi-resolution stuff. So. If the census data is so bad, you know, the existing data on poverty, how do you validate your results? If, you know, once you've made your, your poverty prediction, what do you have to check against? Yeah, so uh, we use household survey data from the DHS and the OSMS surveys. And for, so they're bad because they're, they're not very complete. Like for many African countries, there's, there haven't been surveys taken within the last like 10 or 15 years. But we do have, for DHS and LSMS, we have surveys for like five to 10 countries. So we, we can just like split those into like training and validation sets within each country. All right, that's all we have time for questions. Thank you.